Hello everybody and welcome back to our Rain World modding tutorial series. In this video, I'm going to be explaining and showing visually how to make tiles. Now, first I should explain what exactly tiles are. So when you're making a level, tiles are going to be like the visual things of the level, you know, the machines and doohickeys that you give your level to make it look fun, right? Look at all these doohickeys. All the machines and 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 um and pipes and vents and fences and just making your level look you know detailed right it's the thing that you make your level out of right that's what tiles are so i'm going to be going over how you can make your own tiles so first, I need to define and explain some preliminary terms and concepts. First is that a level is made up of cells, and these cells align to a grid, and tiles will align to this grid as well. But these cells are the geometry of your room, where a cell could be a solid wall, um, any of the four slopes, a floor, a piece of glass, or just open air. And tiles will need to fit their shape to align with these geometry types. Secondly, is that graphically each cell is 20 pixels wide and 20 pixels tall. So when making a tile, it'll need to align to that 20 by 20 grid. So if you're making tiles, you'll want to be kinda somewhat familiar with how levels are even made. Um, so the basic, I like structure of a level is that there are three layers. There's the foreground layer, there's the middle layer, and then there, there's the back layer. It's layer one, layer two, and layer three, right? And these different layers, you know, the foreground is really all that matters, um, in terms of gameplay, because that's where the, the, uh, that's where you play, right? The two ones behind that are primarily used for like detail and depth, right? Making the room look nice. And when you render a room, it will have this like 3D depth effect. That is if you have a camera angle. This right here is what it might look like without a camera angle. But if I were to move my mouse around, then you can see that you can see the individual depths. Do you see that? So something important to know about these depths is that each one of these layers has exactly 10 what are called sub layers. So if you counted those, there'd be 10. And then you could count those and there'd be another 10. So if you counted all of these, there would be 30. Now tiles usually only apply to just a single layer, right? You, you put it there and behind it, you know, nothing. So when you are making a tile, it's going to have that depth. And the most fun tiles to use are the ones that have depth. Like, look at this fan up here. Or these fans. Hmm? Hmm? Or that right there in the back. Do you see that? It's got depth. Or these pipes too. Look at those pipes. Depth. So when you're making a tile, it's essentially just a like a 3d model almost of your graphic right where you give it 10 different uh depth layers right so when the room is being rendered and you give it a camera angle it looks like you know a 3d solid object yeah so one thing i should also mention is that the player draws at a depth of five so if you were to zoom in and look, they would be five layers back. So that would mean that they're in the middle of the first main layer, in the middle of those first 10 sublayers. So there'd be five sublayers in front of the player and five sublayers behind the player. So to show this, I can put, I can load up this level and I can put these fake skugs everywhere and you can see that they are on the fifth layer back. So when you have a tile, like say, 
this ball here, the front of it can be smaller than the fifth layer back. And it can be smaller, and then that would give the illusion that it's rounding out as you go towards the front. Or like, look at these pillar tiles in the back. They have a little platform you can stand on, but also this in the back behind the player. So to make it a little more obvious, I can increase the strength of everything. And you can sort of see, <laughs> oh my god. You can see these skugs back here just standing on these two balls. And then those balls get smaller as the as it gets closer to the camera. But yeah, the player renders with a depth of five. So you want to be aware because if your tile has specific geometry requirements, then you're going to want to make sure that those, you know, match at that fifth depth layer because that's where the player is going to be. Now, just to make sure that you understand this, when I say a depth of five on your tile, this would equate to the sixth image down. So this would be a depth of zero. This would be a depth of one. This would be a depth of two. This would be a depth of three. This would be a depth of four. And this would be a depth of five. So the fifth depth layer is the one, two, three, four, five, sixth image in your sprite sheet. It's more commonly used to say depth layers as in like depth offsets starting from a depth of zero but because we're actually making these tile images i want to make it clear that when i say a depth of five that corresponds to the sixth sprite in the tile image so something important to know about tiles is that you can only actually use three colors these being the sort of different highlights that your tile can have. This is because Rain World draws everything with palettes. So when you're, making a when you're making a tile, all you can really do is specify which pixels are shaded from the front, shaded with light, or shaded with dark. Green means the pixel is being lit neutrally. Blue means it's being hit by light and red means it's under shadow. There is a precedent that when you're, making a when you're making a tile, that you make the sort of faux light source come from the top left. So all corners and edges that are on the top left should be shaded blue. Everything in the middle should be shaded green, and everything on the bottom right should be shaded red. And it's, it's important to utilize these colors properly. So it's if we look at this tile, this little section here is important because this blue area gives the illusion that something is popping out because light is reflecting off of it. And this darkened area gives the illusion that something is popping out because it's being shaded. So you can use these colors to give the illusion that your tile has more intricate detail than it really does in 3D. Because tiles can only have so much 3D to them. Now, I know that's a lot. And it's okay if you don't get it right away. Feel free to watch this video multiple times or ask me any questions. But... Let's get into the tricky stuff. First, let's say how big we want our tile to be. So let's say that we are going to make a four wide and two tall tile. Let's call this size SZ and let's put it aside. So to begin, the width of your tile's image is going to be the width of your tile. So for me, that's four times 20 being the scale of a single cell. So here that would give us 80. For the height, it's going to be the height of your tile times 20, but it's actually going to be also multiplied by 10 
because remember that tiles have depth layers to them. So we add those to the bottom of the image. So in our case, that's 2 times 20 times 10, which gives us 400. At the bottom, we're also going to want to add the little area where the tile preview will be shown inside the level editor. This has a scale of 16 per cell. So for our case, this would be 2, being the height of our tile, times 16, which is 32. And the width of this as well would be 4 times 16. Now, last but not least, for some reason, every tile needs to have this one singular pixel at the top as a vertical offset for everything. Tiles and a lot of other things in the level editor require this single pixel. I don't know why, but it needs to be there, so just be aware of that. So in the end, this will be 400 plus 32 plus 1 for our example, so that gives us 433. So together, our tile is 433 by 80. So we can create a new image that size and draw our tile in there. To generalize this, we can call the size W and H for width and height. In general, the width of our image is going to be W times 20. The height of our image is going to be H times 20 times 10 for the depth layers, plus H times 16 for the tile preview, plus 1 for the vertical offset. So once you have your blank tile image with the correct size, all of these sections here are going to be where you actually draw your tile. So these areas are the different depth layers of your tile. And so for our example, let's just fill it in. So you could imagine this as the top being closest to the camera and the bottom being furthest from the camera. So if you imagine this as a shape, it would be like an oval. So if I actually go ahead and open this in my visualization tool, the tile will look something like this. And if I move it around, you can see that it's got that like curved oval platform shape to it, right? You can see the layer closest to the front is the thinnest and then it gets thicker as it goes back. So this will be what our tile looks like when we, you know, have it with camera angles and such. Now, you might notice that some of these layers in this tile are repeated, like these four. If your tile has multiple layers that repeat the same texture, you can actually collapse those down into just a single layer, but you need to label that with how many times it should repeat. We're also going to want to label all of the ones that show up just once, as they repeat only one time for the single time that they're there. And this sequence of numbers becomes repeat L. And if you've done this correctly, if you add up all of the numbers, it should exactly equal 10. So let's put this to the side as well. Now, let's fit this to some geometry. So our tile has a shape like this. So we could fill it in with this kind of shape, some blocks and some slopes. Let's call this shape specs and put it aside. And finally, we can just name our tile. This example is copying from Turbine Platform, so let's call this NM, and these are the variables that you'll need for your tile to be initialized correctly. Now the format for tile registration looks like this. And I know it's, it's complicated, but one at a time, let's fill in our values. So Turbine Platform just goes straight into NM, our size goes into SZ, and we do need to make sure that it says point before it as that's Lingo's way of parsing a uh, coordinate. We can move repeat L down in there. And finally, we have our specs. I saved this for the last because representing geometry in this step is a little complicated. So let's go back to our geometry types. Of these eight geometry types that a tile can use, each of them is assigned a number. So open air is zero, solid wall is one, a slope going left and up is two, a slope going right and up is 3, a slope going left and down is 4, and a slope going right and down is 5. 
A floor piece is six and glass is nine. Now I should note that seven and eight are unused and won't do anything if used. You can also put negative one, which will essentially ignore geometry requirements. So for example, if you had, if you had a tile that was just the border of something, you wouldn't want to require that the middle be air. So instead of putting zero, you'd put negative one. So anything that was already there won't be overwritten. So going back to our tile, we can express this as these eight numbers. Then to flatten this into a single list, we'll go from the top left to the bottom right. So first we'll put one and we'll go down and put five. Then we'll go up and put one, down one, up one, down one, up one, and finally down four. And this becomes our specs. So we can bring up our tile initialization again and slot that right in there. This becomes our tile initialization line. So if you're an eagle-eyed viewer, you might notice that I haven't actually explained these few tags. These are all simple, but you needed to understand the basics first, so that's why I'm ending with these. So let's first begin with RND, which stands for random. If you want your tile to have multiple random variations, say for instance, you have a sign tile that you want to use random symbols for. To do this, we just add all of those to the right. So we can create all of these extra slots and just copy over and put those new tiles in there. And the number of columns that you have is the number that you'll put for the RND. So for us, that's 14. And if you have just one, the default is one because there's only one variation. Now let's go over BF tiles, which stands for buffer tiles. Let's say that you don't want to be restricted to just the geometry of, of your tile. Let's say you have something like this and you want loose cables to be hanging out. Instead of trying to make the size bigger and doing weird geometry things, the simple thing to do is just increase buffer tiles. So for this example, let's go in and increase it by one. This will extend the area that we can draw our sprite in. Now this isn't quite large enough for our example, so let's actually increase this to two. And this area becomes the new area that we can draw our sprite in. So each of these layers will have more space to draw around it. But the player will still only interact with however big the size of the tile is. So the size of this tile is just three, but the size that we can draw in is three plus the buffer tiles times two. And the same goes for the height. The height of this tile is three. The area that we can draw in has a height of three plus the buffer tiles times two. So in general, with some width w and height h, the width of the area that you can draw in is going to be the width of your tile plus the number of buffer tiles times two. And the height of the area that you can draw in is the height of your tile plus the number of buffer tiles times two. The reason why it's multiplied by two is because you're adding that number to the top and the bottom. So in the end, the more, say, advanced formula for the size of your tile is going to be, for the width of your image, it's going to be the width of your tile plus the number of buffer tiles times two, all multiplied by 20, that being the cell size, all multiplied by how many random variations you have, with the default being one, of course. And the height of your tile image is going to be the height of your tile plus the number of buffer tiles times two, all times 20, that being the size of a single cell, multiplied by the number of layers that you have, plus the height of your tile times 16 for the tiles preview, plus one for that vertical offset that's required. Lastly, there are a number of tags that you can give your tile. I'm not going to be going through all of them. You can read about them on the wiki. I'm simply going to be going over effect colors. So remember our signs example from earlier. If you're a level editor, you should know that sign tiles use effect colors. 
If you don't know what effect colors are, they are basically special colors that work outside of the palette that you can specify per level. So for this example, any pixel that we want to use an effect color, we are going to shade magenta or the pixel color of 100% red and 100% blue. And we do this for all of the pixels that we want to have this effect color. Now, something about effect colors is that they can actually have a strength. So to add that strength, what we're going to want to do is actually just append everything to the right. So we just double the width of our tile. And this here will be the strength of those effect colors. Now, what this means is basically the darker the pixel is, the stronger that that effect color will appear. So here in the middle, it's fully black. So if we go over to the tile, this area in the middle is going to be the strongestly lit by the color. Now, something to note is that this gradient, as it's called, will only apply to the pixels that have this magenta color. Now, so it should be noted that when you're doing these gradients, I would generally recommend that you give a little padding around it, not just fitting it exactly to the pixels. And this is because when you apply things like effects over your tile, like say the melt effect, it's going to drag those pixels down. And if you have your thing constrained explicitly to those pixels. Just correcting myself here, the reason why I'd suggest giving padding is because then when you apply those melt effects, you know, if there's a gradient above it, then that's going to melt down into the visible part of the sign. But if there's no gradient above it, then the only thing that's going to melt is the like shape of the sign and it i suppose it depends on the kind of look you're going for but there is in fact a difference so just be aware of that that's why i'd give padding around these things and not just fit them exactly to the pixels and it's okay to give padding around these because this will only apply to the parts that are just magenta and if you want the technical information on that the place that these things get set to is technically a different image to the thing to the layer that these get set to and it's only when it's making the final render that it combines those two together so it's okay to make the gradient extend beyond just the magenta pixels now this example was specifically for the tag effect color a now, if we wanted to use effect color B, it works exactly the same, except that instead of magenta, you do cyan, which is 100% green and 100% blue. And then the tag for this one would be effect color B. I don't know if you can use both at the same time. I don't know. So lastly, there's PT pause. This doesn't actually do anything, but it needs to be there lest things break. But it doesn't actually do anything, so don't worry about it. And then there's TP, which is the type of your tile. There's a few different ones. The basic one is going to be voxel struct, which is the one that we went over today. There's also voxel struct random displace vertical and voxel struct random displace horizontal. So to go ahead and see what this looks like, I've went ahead and placed a few of these tiles in this room. You know, visually, the tile preview will look exactly the same. But when we actually look at the rendered image, let me pull that up. When we look at the rendered image, you can see there is this random displacement. It's random per the vertical or horizontal layer that it's on. So these two are the same. And this one is offset. This one is offset. These, way more obvious, you can see the offsets. But this will basically just like offset where the tile draws from. 
So for these chains, it's really helpful and really nice if you want to, you know, make your chains look more random. I don't know why these balls use it, but, you know, it's fun. <laughs> and you know what? I think I'm noticing these don't seem to be shifted in graphical tile units. These are shifted different pixel amounts. Ooh, that's fascinating. Regardless, that's what those do. Okay, lastly, for the sake of, like, completionism, make sure I get everything. Tiles can actually, if you wanted, they can use two main layers instead of just one. That being 20 depth layers, right? And you can set geometry requirements for both the first layer and the second layer. The first layer would just be specs, but then specs 2 is where you would put the geometry requirements of the second part, half of it, the you know, second layer of it. If you don't have, you know, a, that second layer, then specs 2 is just going to be zero, so don't touch it. But if you do have two layers, then you'd separate the first and the second between specs and specs 2. And maybe you think, well, why do I need to specify specs 2 geometry requirements if the player only interacts with the first layer? Well, it's because technically the second layer is, is also like, the geometry is also like there for the game. It's basically like what lizards can like wall climb on. Also, if you have two layers, repeat L is going to add to 20 instead of 10. And I don't think you can have 30 layers in a single tile. I haven't tried it, but I assume it's not possible because I've never seen it. But for the sake of completeness, I had to mention. So all of this formatting can be quite complicated and scary. So it might take you a while to fully understand it. But before we end the video, I'm going to explain how to actually get these in the level editor. So first, you're going to find your graphics folder. So that would be in your data folder in the graphics folder. This is where all of the tile images will go. And you can actually see and view examples of different tiles here if you wanted. But there should be a file called init.txt. And when you open this file, it's going to be a list of all of these complicated initialization lines. But what you can do is just scroll to the bottom and to make a new tile category, you just paste in something like this. So you have a dash and then a bracket and then the name of your category. So let's call this my tiles and then a color. So this is just going to be an RGB thing. And then you can go ahead and paste the initialization line that we built. And you save this and you close it out. So that's all I have for this video. If you have any questions, please ask either in the comments below or join my Discord server if you want more one on one feedback. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope I explained things well and I hope you understand. So I'll see you all in the next video. Bye bye.